GreatCon Friday bar. I'll tell you a little bit about GreatConf and what's going on and what's not going on. Um, then we have a tech talk, uh, about 30 minutes. And then we'll just say cheer, chat, and hang out with uh, you all from the community. So GreatConf 2020 was canceled due to COVID-19. And GreatConf 21, I'm not sure that's going to happen either. Um, there's um, just a small decline here in Denmark with the virus, but not anything that looks like anything that will allow us to open up. Anyway, not in the springtime and possibly not in the fall either. So I think it will be wiser for us being a small conference to uh, uh, sit it out and wait until 2022. So nothing is planned yet. Um, if things change significantly, um, it might change. But for now, we'll just uh, keep it on the low and um, hopefully we'll get back to some kind of normal within a year or something and, and pick it up from there. I, I know there's a uh, longing for going to conferences and I hope that will show in participation numbers when we get to that. So our tech talk today is a Spock 2.0 update uh, with um, Inna Brunings from Germany, I believe. And um, when we're done with that, and uh, please take a, uh, put your questions in the chat and please keep your microphone muted. I'll, I'll allow you to unmute it, but uh, I think it's better that uh, we don't get disturbed too much. And then afterwards we can try and open up for discussion. I have not done this before as a host, so I don't know how it will go yet, but um, Leonard, um, you can uh, take it away now. So the format for today was uh, to go just over the release notes, talk about it and collect your questions and answer those questions afterwards. So the first milestone uh, was released <laughs> one year ago, or a bit more than one year ago, and um, we switched from the old JNet4 uh, to the new, new JNet5 platform. And uh, with that came a lot of changes. One is Spock now requires Java 8. We now unroll by default because the new JUnit platform allows for a tree structure, so that makes it more natural to unroll it by default. Some stuff was really uh, removed like uh, retry mode for feature, um, which doesn't work uh, anymore with the new reporting structure. Um, we removed the Spock report module. Uh, this has never been officially released, but um, we wanted to focus on the current feature sets and remove the craft for now. Um, yeah, removed uh, Spring.x uh, to X testing um, as it been incompatible with Java 8. So then for the milestone two, uh, we added Groovy 2 support. Uh, Groovy 3.0 support, uh, thanks to Marcin for that. And uh, removed, we removed the Sputnik runner. It was already not working anymore, but uh, we now removed the code. So there were some people that used uh, the Sputnik runner as a delegate uh, for PowerMock, for example, or to do some hacky things with executing Spock multiple times on the spec level. Um, that won't work anymore. There's some magic uh, that you can do, um, which will I come to in M3. But um, for most cases, uh, yeah, don't do it anymore. Wedding adding uh, added a pending feature if annotation. So if you're familiar with pending feature, you can say um, this feature 
uh, does not work yet, um, it will be skipped and afterwards. And if it actually ran successful, it will fail so that you can remove the pending feature. Now you can do it conditionally so that you can say, okay, it doesn't work on Windows, for example, but everything where else it should work. Some small stuff with um, that stub interactions now fail fast um, and cleaned up that um, you can't spy on already spy instances um, as it was or were always um, wrong stuff to do. The JVM helper method um, utility got some new uh, Java versions and removed we removed all pre-8 versions as Bock requires 8 now. And that's for M2. There is a so as you can see, M3 is a bit more. There is a request for assuming the font a little bit. Oh, sure. Let's see. Is that better? Okay. Um, yeah. So in M3, um, the addendum to the removed Sputnik runner, um, here's a really convoluted way to get it to work if you still need it, but I don't recommend it. It was just added for completeness sake. Um, but I would suggest to just disregard this. Then we also removed the JNode 4 dependency from Spock Core. So um, if you are migrating uh, and have rules um, like test rule or class rule from uh, JNode 4, we added a new Spock, 4, uh, Spock JNode 4 um, module. So with that, uh, you can get support back uh, for all JNode 4 to make migration easier. And there are some side effects that um, you could actually use the add before after annotations um, in um, Spock code. And those would uh, work and would actually be, uh, be called before the setup methods um, and now they would be invoked afterwards. Just a thing to keep in mind, but I think for most users, those changes won't affect them. Then remove, uh, we reduce the Groovy dependencies of Spock Core. So now we only depend on Groovy Jar. So I think before we had uh, Groovy SQL and so on. So if you depended on that, you would need to add those dependencies yourself. Yeah, update to a new JNet version. But this is more interesting. Um, we changed the meaning of return underscore as this has been always present in Spock, but it was never really documented. And before it was um, use the default response, which would is basically the same as to leave it out. And now we changed it to return a stub value. So this is more interesting for mocks. If you don't want to return null, but don't actually care about the value, you can now use the underscore to uh, return any value that's not null. Then um, renamed, we renamed the iteration token. So in Spock 1.3, you could have in the unroll doc declaration iteration count. Um, but we felt that this was a bit misleading from the naming here, and now it's iteration index. So if you have this in your uh, unroll declarations, you would need to do a global search and replace for that. Then there's also a small change to data variables and data pipes. So if you did this, basically you have a data pipe up here and you try to refer to this uh, value from the data, data pipe above and for the B, this doesn't work anymore. The new syntax that is actually more clear is to just use uh, the equal sign to assign it. Then um, we assert unroll expressions by default 
Um, before this change, uh, you could uh, activate it by an system property, but now it's uh, enforced by default. And this means that before you got an error, if you had some uh, unrecognized um, data variable in your unrolled declaration, now uh, the spec will actually fail at that. If you don't want that behavior, you can set it back to the old behavior in the configuration file via unroll validate expressions false. Then uh, we also changed how uh, Spock deals with data variables and parameter names. Before those two um, methods would return the same value, but this is actually not required anymore. So you can have more data variables and parameter names, or you can have more parameter names and data variables, uh, or actually different um, since now extensions could inject parameter names and you are free to leave out uh, data variables from your parameters if you actually have something like uh, a description data variable that you just used in your unroll definition and don't actually care about in your um, method body. So now you can leave that out. <laughs> yes. And um, if we can't resolve um, a parameter, it's mis uh, with a placeholder missing argument. When we expect expect a specific um, an extension to resolve this, but if it's not done, then an exception will be thrown at the runtime. So, for the spec and deve um, extension developers to keep in mind. Then. We also removed an really old uh, end support. If you still need this, you can just go into the old uh, source code and copy the um, spec class file selector uh, to your own build. And now we have some miscellaneous stuff. What's really, what's really nice is the new mutable clock utility. So in the docs, for example, Okay, it doesn't load right now. I'll come back to it later. Um, what's it? Basically, you can, uh, if you are familiar with the new JSR 310 at the time, you have a time API, you have a clock and a fixed clock. But if you were to actually to advance the clock in the test, that wasn't possible anymore. And uh, now there's a small utility that is a mutable clock, so you can advance your time during the test. Then we also cleaned up or improved the syntax for stubbing um, property access. You could either do um, the getter or it was possible to before to use the property syntax, but you had to prefix it with it dot. And this is not necessary anymore. So you can just use uh, bar return value. This would be the same as um, get bar. Um, and now it's possible to use two or more underscores to separate a where block. So if you have a really long um, where block, you can actually break it up uh, into more sections with underscores between them. And this is also similar to that one, that you can now do something else than um, pipes for the where block, as you can now use semicolons. That might be interesting for some that um, use pipes and expressions, but you can't mix it inside. Um, but I think the ID support for that pattern is not that great right now. I haven't verified it yet. <laughs> then we had a uh, fix that typecast were not properly carried over. Um, this was if you had method overloaded and wanted to call it with null, 
it was not possible before to say with a typecast uh, which method you actually wanted to invoke. This is now possible. And um, with the new unroll by default, we also decided to change the default unroll pattern because this one, this was not that informative with just the feature name and the duration index. So the new default pattern will actually list all data variables and the iteration index. So um, you don't have to do it yourself, but you can, um, if you want the old pattern back for globally, you can just set it in the default pattern again. Um, yes. And you could, uh, yeah, this one just the same as that. Um, and iteration index now is included in the iteration info. So then you can use this also. Um, similar to the type arguments uh, from above, is here that it's also now possible in constructor parameters uh, to call it uh, with a cast null value. And we fixed accessing previous data column values um, in data tables. Yeah, and uh, which go, this one goes back to what I also mentioned in the uh, parameter and data variables. We now match by um, name and not by order. So before your data tables had to have the, the same order as your parameters, that is no longer the case um, and will be matched by name. Yeah, and this one is what I also mentioned above. Um, that you can leave it out. And um, for our existing conditions like requires, ignore if, and pending feature if, you can now get the uh, precondition context uh, passed in. So then you can uh, assert some stuff on that. <laughs> For many, this is not really uh, important, but some might want to test Spock with an yet unsupported Groovy version. For that, uh, we added this property um, that disables the Spock version check for Groovy so that you could test it with Groovy 4 or something else um, just for those that need it. That's not really important. Um, yeah, the derived data variables, you can now um, do deconstructing with that. So if you had a row from an SQL, you can now deconstruct it uh, with a deconstruction syntax. And if you have data pipes, the syntax is a bit different. As you now see, here's normal parenthesis, here are brackets, but you can uh, now unroll this as well. Um, deconstruct it as well and ignore values if you just use the underscore. And an interesting feature is that you can now use data variables and the conditions of the ignore if requires and other condition annotations. If you use data variables, um, the ex um, the condition will actually be evaluated twice. The first time it will fail because it will be evaluated before any um, data variable is accessible, but we detect this and run the data providers and provide it again. So just keep in mind that this um, runs the uh, data provider to get access to the data variables if you use that feature. Yeah. And this is another thing that's uh, related to the unroll by default. You actually don't need the unroll annotation anymore, but you can still use it to have a custom pattern. Um, 
I used it often to have a simple specification name and a more complex unroll pattern. So this is still valid. But we had some users that said, oh, we have uh, 10,000 uh, values and we don't want to have those actually reported. So for those, we introduced a rollup that actually restores the previous behavior of not reporting the individual iterations anymore. Yeah, and you can also do it on a spec level as well. And in this case, we also introduced general by default false, which would be uh, like the 1.3 behavior. Um, some OSGI improvements. Yeah, type information, not really important. We added a new um, method for spying that you could actually uh, do the interactions that you had in many uh, other like mock and stop. So this uh, moves the spy interface uh, closer to the others. And that's the important stuff for M3. So now let's go to M4. This looks not that expensive, but the main feature is parallel execution support. Um, I will go over that uh, later. So the other stuff is um, you can now use configuration objects outside of a, a global extension. If you were uh, in Spoc 1, you had to have uh, this configuration object as a field in the global extension to use it in a notation ex driven extension. That is not necessary anymore. You can now um, register the configuration object um, in a services file um, and use it in the annotation driven extension directly. <laughs> then we added support to make extensions repeatable. If you do this, um, Spock will handle it appropriately. And we introduced um, a new method with its spec annotations that will actually give you the array of all annotations um, so that you can do some uh, optimized handling. But uh, this one will just call uh, with its spec annotation individually by default. So if you don't overwrite with its spec annotations, you would go, still get called sequentially for each uh, annotation. And those annotations here actually now use this feature and are repeatable. So you can have multiple at issue annotations um, if you would like to have this instead of the list of issues inside. And here it's now possible to use um, instance fields uh, for requires ignore if and pending feature if. If you uh, preface those with instance dot, you can actually uh, access those fields. Yeah. And then the move to Java 8, um, we deprecated the abstract annotation driven extension since we um, just moved all those methods as default methods to the interface. And one thing that often came up when using JUnit 4 and migrating to Spock 2 was that uh, you can't use the temp data rule anymore. So now we have a temp data built in extension that you can use to get a temp directory. If you annotate a file or path field, then you get an, uh, those injected. <laughs> And now pending feature and pending feature if play nicely together. Um, yeah, in the Groovy changed some stuff how it would call set a getter handling. This made some internal uh, fixes necessary. Those are these things. Yes, not that important anymore. And most of those are rather fresh. 
um, some merge today. This one is, um, we had this feature, as you can see, 76 for a really long time, the request to be able to inject uh, from a spring context into shared fields. This is now possible by adding the enabled shared injection. We do it this way and not enable it by default because there are edge cases that don't work like you would expect. Um, and the enabled shared injection checks for some of those and includes some nodes in the Java doc for stuff you need to watch out for if you use it. Then we added a new display name um, property for um, the spec info feature and info and iteration info. With this, you can now properly set um, the reported name that will be reported to the test output. Before, you could override the name, but if you changed the name of the feature info, this would actually leak in the iteration info and uh, lead to unwanted changes. So now you, those are better separated and make it more easy to include stuff um, in the feature info display name or spec info as well. And um, we also added support for constructor injections uh, for extensions. Before we had a direct field injection, which is um, now deprecated and um, we suggest to use uh, constructor injections going forward. And you can still use both if, you, if your extension should support both. Um, Spock will actually look for the most fitting constructor and only fall back uh, to field injection if it doesn't find one. With the move to Groovy 3, um, we had issues with final fields. Um, since Spock actually rewrites um, the initialization, initialization of fields from the direct initialization to a initialization method. And this worked in previous versions of Groovy, but Groovy 3 was stricter and um, complained about that. So now we are keeping uh, the intention of the final field so that you don't actually modify it. But we still keep the uh, Spock behavior that it's initialized in a different method by hiding the actual field and just providing a getter. So for the user code, this shouldn't uh, need any changes. Um, it would still behave like a final field for those. Yeah. Then the uh, previously introduced parallel extensions now support inheritance. And like the uh, notation-driven extension, now we also did it for the abstract global extension. This is deprecated and uh, replaced by the default methods in the global extension. Then an tempter um, was also not really supporting inheritance. This is fixed. And yeah, the other ones are just fixes for individual stuff. So now let me see if I can get the parallel stuff to work. How's the time, Soren? I need to unmute myself first. Well, we are, you, you, have, you can run five, 10 minutes more if you want. I'm sure people can hang on. Okay, so then I would just give a quick introduction. Um, so with the JNet uh, platform, um, that platform actually supports parallel uh, execution and Spock taps into that and provides uh, its superset on that. You can enable it um, if you use runner parallel enable true in the Spock configuration. And um, this is what you have normally, so that um, everything is sequential. And if you go to the full uh, parallels stuff, you go, everything runs in parallel and you can see 
you may now only need eight units instead of 22 units. We have separate execution modes uh, for the um, spec level and for the feature level. So if you run your specs concurrent, but the uh, features on the same thread, it would look like this. The specs start at the same time, but inside the specs, they run uh, the same thread, uh, so sequentially. And the other one would be to run the specifications uh, sequentially, but the features uh, concurrently. So you see all the features of the first spec run concurrently, and then afterwards the uh, features of the second spec. I won't go to, into too much detail, um, but having parallel execution can lead to some problems if you access shared data. And for that, I would actually suggest to read this really carefully since Spock provides um, methods to deal with this. Um, since we added support for locks, so you can use resource locks to say, okay, I have this shared resource and some specs that actually don't have anything to do together use the shared resource and now I can use uh, the resource lock and the framework will make sure that uh, nothing else uh, that uses the same re resource runs at the same time. Or you can say, I only care about that this is not modified, um, but I'm not actually modifying it myself. Um, this would be a read lock. Um, those can run in parallel, but anything that modifies the shared resource would need a write lock um, and run alone. Then there is some uh, special handling for this that I won't explain in detail, but uh, just to make you aware that um, there's some stuff that makes it complicated uh, to work with parallel stuff. Um, but it actually really provides many benefits. So depending on your test base, uh, it's you get, can gain quite much without having any of those problems. And then there's also the isolated execution, which is like a global lock. So if you modify something that is used by everything else, you or you have doing something uh, performance critical and timing, you say, I don't want anything else running at the same time. You can just run an isolated and then this spec will run only isolated and in the same thread mode uh, for the spec and everything else runs either before or after. And here are some settings for the thread pool that you can do. So you can say, okay, I want a dynamic load factor. For example, if you do dot five, you would say I use half my processors. And um, with this one, you can say, um, I want a dynamic factor, but I want at least X numbers of processors um, by default reserved. Uh, this is actually what Spock uses by default. We say use every uh, processor, but keep two threads uh, reserved for Gradle um, and the rest of the operating system. Yes. Okay. So I think we now can go over to questions. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, uh, people just unmute themselves if they have questions. Yeah, I agree. It's clap. Silent, silent claps. <laughs> Thanks. Now there's one question that says ETA. Um, we actually thinking of releasing M5 soonish. And if we don't have any issues then reported, I think then it can go 
uh, final. They are still, there are already uh, many projects that use the M4 and um, don't have any issues. So I would encourage everyone to try it out. And if we release M5, try it out that one as well. So that we can find any lingering issues and get a really good uh, 2.0 version out then. One question about uh, all this reporting stuff, which has been uh, removed. Um, I like to use uh, uh, Spock reports and um, the, the plugin by Renato Ataides. And yeah. I wonder whether it will still work. Um, I think I saw an announcement that he uh, made it work with 2.0. So I guess so. I haven't seen any issues that came up um, that should prevent him from doing anything. Great. What we removed was an, an internal pl uh, plugin, the Spock uh, reports um, that was never released only in the uh, snapshot one. So okay. this should then, shouldn't have any effect uh, for him. Thanks. There's a question from Daniel Dimu. Uh, how does Spock schedule isolated specs? Um, isolated specs will work by uh, acquiring the global lock. So we actually, uh, or the general um, platform uses um, the uh, real locks for those and every uh, node that executes acquires a read lock for the global lock. And if you run isolated, you re uh, require a write lock and um, you wait as long as uh, until you get a write lock for those um, and then you run um, isolated from everything else. I see you have a look on the uh, questions yourself. So. Yeah. So randomly at some point in the test run, yes. Um, the locks are, uh, when the locks are available. So um, we use the, or uh, JNET used the fork uh, join thread pool with a managed block for that. Um, so that you don't lose threads. Um, new threads will be spawned if you're waiting for a, on an existing lock. Um, but it's not, um, you can't say it will run first or last. It's when you get the lock. Um, which major feature did I leave out? Um, I think um, the, what we will de-scope uh, is the um, data-driven execution. Um, this I'll post the. So we're actually looking for comments. We have a proposal for how we think we will do it. Um, it has been requested a lot, but um, this will require some extensive work. So we think getting Spock 2.0 out there is more important than getting that feature in. So, um, and regarding to the uh, Grails major release, uh, how soon would you need it? Uh, we would be doing uh, it in a couple of weeks based on our testing or maybe, you know, not too far away, so. Okay, have you already integrated with Spock 2.0? Yeah, we are testing with the milestones. I think we saw some issues with the latest milestone and I'll let you know, but if I can, uh, maybe that was because of something removed uh, in Spock. Uh, I think that was fixture methods, but yeah. Okay. Um, 
right now the snapshot build is not updated. That's something I need to fix. Uh, this is caused because Travis decided to uh, limit open source builds by default, and we switched to GitHub Actions, and I've not set up the publishing yet. It's just stuff to be done, not that complicated, but that's why I have the local preview because the M5 release notes are not published uh, right now. Yeah, we also need to get up actions. <laughs> So yeah, it would have some timeline, you know, so that we could plan, uh, you know, if we want to do it with milestone, but, you know, I would love to see it with the GA. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's talk about it. Um, I think it might be possible to release the M5 soon. I need to look at the PRs, but I think there is not really anything major left. And, um, Wait for feedback on the new change stuff, and if everything looks good, then get the 2.0 release version out. Awesome. So, did I overlook any questions? Let me check again. There was a new question about um, international churches in unroll perimeters. Um. I haven't verified it. I would assume it works, but uh, if not, uh, create an issue with a test. Um, I think it should work. Uh, we we have seen some uh, problems with it in uh, our tests. Uh, you know, in, in Denmark, we have three uh, letters that are not in the normal alphabet and uh, Groovy supports that we can use them in uh, names in the where clause, but uh, if you use them in the, the, the on roll parameters, it gives an error. Ah, you mean as uh, variable names, not as uh, meth um, normal? Yeah, as, as variable right. names in From the data table. OK. All the, the injected properties uh, something Danish, then it uh, turns up as error. It doesn't fail the test or anything, but uh, it makes it difficult to see what the hell is going on sometimes. I guess create an issue for that, and we'll have a look at it, if it's easy to fix or not. And based on that, it will, will be fixed, on, uh, or we will defer it until some later time if it's really complicated. Yeah, but the best thing is just create a issue with a test case um, that fails. Yeah. yeah, so Leonard, I have uh, one question um, and I'm not even sure if the support is there in JUnit 5 now, but something like the concept of uh, test suits or something or that extensions can have a life cycle according to a group of tests that spans multiple classes or maybe there is something in Spock already that would support such a thing probably not or no we don't have anything like that at the moment I don't know if we have a feature request for that but um, if not, create one. Yeah, if you have the use case for that. When, when I checked in JUnit uh, five, uh, it was some years ago, but they were just they were discussing the concept of um, suit. But you you like a use case is uh, setting up certain uh, services or whatever for a suit of tests that are only necessary for this suit. So something that to a certain degree Spring Boot test does implicitly by ordering their annotations and so on, but yeah. Mm -hmm. But would you also require that no other tests of other uh, things would be executed or? Um... No, not necessarily. Or this could be kind of managed with those resource logs from what I saw now there actually yeah. but uh, kind of having in an extension just callbacks like those callbacks points that would be a good thing 
but probably it's something that uh, should first come to JUnit and then Spock should build upon this, I think. Um, you have to separate JUnit Jupyter from the JUnit platform. So um, with the separation, um, we can't actually support JUnit Jupyter extensions because uh, their extension model is quite complex. Um, I've looked into it, but um, discarded this for to zero and probably to one. I don't think um, I'll take a look before two two again at this. Um, so if they do it in Jupiter, then it doesn't mean it will work for Spock directly. So we might have to do it something differently. But we could maybe do it because we could introduce a new uh, suit node and those would be then um, executed, might be possible. Yeah, okay, that sounds sounds good. I thought this would kind of be blocked from the JUnit architecture, but yes, I try to write up something about what I have in mind at one point. <laughs> All right. Anything? Any other questions? Yeah. Otherwise, we'll. So I have one. It might be just my limited understanding of Spock. Uh, is, are there any features, any good ways for all deciding which test runs first? Uh, instead of writing a suit that has sort of the whole, that we have to list all the tests, and we have some fast tests that we say, well, you know, these things they. They run in six milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, run those first, and then we have the ones that take a second and a half and so on. So we prefer them to run last. So, so say, give a preferred order of tests that just like. Um, there is the run order optimize extension. Okay. Um, but that one, tries to order failed tests first um, so that you see if they fail again. Otherwise, you can do something with includes and excludes. So actually have two runs and one that just has the fast included and a second run that only executes those um, slow tests. Um, that would be the uh, simple stuff that would work right now. Okay, thanks. Well, excellent. Thank you again, uh, Lena, for taking your time to present this. Um, we are all a little more enlightened than we were uh, 45 minutes ago. At least I am. <laughs> uh, That's good. And uh, now it's uh, open mic. If anybody has anything to say, otherwise I'll, I'll start by saying cheers, because it is a Friday bar. I know some people in the US are up a little bit early. Maybe it's a bit early for drinks, but you can have coffee or water or whatever you want. And yes, please turn on your camera. It's nice to see everybody's faces here. Yeah, let's stop the recording first.